Hi, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope you're well and enjoying your virtual conference. My name is Ryan Rubin, and today I'm going to be talking about decentralized finance. Is it ready for prime time? I'm really sorry not to be in Vegas today with all of you, but uh, all I can say is here in the UK, it feels pretty hot, and it's almost like we are in the desert. First, the usual disclaimer, uh, I'd like to confirm that the, the views expressed in this talk are my own and are not representative of any views from my employer. Of course, no animals were hurt uh, other than potential unicorns in this research. So today I'm going to give a quick introduction, uh, give you a 101 on what decentralized finance is all about, uh, talk a little bit about the attack landscape and uh, how people might uh, target uh, this particular protocol. And uh, then I'll also talk about a methodology that we've introduced, uh, which effectively looks at key indicators of vulnerabilities and how we might be able to assess uh, DEFI projects in the future. I'll present the results and uh, wrap up with some conclusions. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's uh, once again, Ryan Rubin. Uh, I've been in the security industry for the last 23 years, um, covering a whole range of different topics. Uh, last couple of years, I've had a big interest in blockchain uh, security as well as uh, cyber insurance, uh, and um, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some insights here today. Um, I actually start this talk where I kind of left off last year uh, when I presented a talk at, uh, in the blockchain village on a cryptocurrency heist. And um, what I found quite interesting during that investigation was that um, as the attackers started to move their money and funds around the Ethereum blockchain, um, they started to put some of their funds into a DeFi platform and actually converted quite a lot into something called the DaiCoin, which I'd actually never heard of before. Um, and after doing a bit of research, um, got quite interested in the whole DeFi um, protocol and uh, kind of the alternative finance options that it has. Um, what startled me was that the, the attackers of this particular heist um, were obviously ahead of the game and um, realized that they needed to put their cryptocurrency somewhere uh, in order to ensure that the pricing did not fluctuate and the value or the proceeds of their crime um, did not reduce as the uh, price of Ethereum dropped. Um, uh, so, um, but this talk is not just about hackers um, or, and fraudsters that might be uh, leveraging various platforms to realize their investments in, uh, in, in the blockchain world. Um, it's, uh, it's actually more generally about um, many of us that may be looking at alternative ways of uh, financing and investing in the future. So, I came up with this research hypothesis, uh, which states, you know, firstly, uh, DeFi is becoming uh, really popular, and I'll talk a little bit about that as the show goes on. Uh, but, you know, as their popularity grows, can they withstand the uh, various types of attacks that are going to be attracted by that popularity? Also, is there a way that we can measure the security posture of DeFi projects and do so in a way that's non-invasive? Of course, the assumption we have is that they must have good OPSEC in order to be in this business, right? So why carry out this research? Well, unfortunately, people are still getting hacked. There are several stories in the news and quite a few that I'll discuss uh, as the talk unfolds, um, indicating that there are still compromises out there. Uh, people are still making money out of this um, and therefore, it's really important to um, raise awareness of security related uh, issues, not only um, to those in the security community, like uh, many of you that are attending the talks today, um, but also those outside that community, including a lot of blockchain developers who I understand um, frequent the, uh, the BCH, BCS village. Um, I also wanted to use this research to try and build upon some of the work that others are doing in this space um, and try and move the industry forward in, in a positive direction. And finally, I think this research could also be helpful uh, for both consumers, uh, those in the insurance space, investors, and also owners 
um, of DEFI projects. Uh, because the last thing you want to be doing after spending weekends, hours, days, months, and years building up your DEFI project is find that it all goes down the drain because of some city security issue that we've got to close. So DEFI 101. So what is decentralized finance? Well, if we look at traditional finance products that you might buy from your bank today or some uh, of the financial products that investment bankers are using, um, you can see that you know, there are common trends around loans, derivatives, uh, asset swaps, and even insurance that can be provided to each of us um, through a traditional uh, banking uh, environment. Uh, one of the, the issues and challenges with that um, is, is the centralized aspects of it. And uh, what decentralized finance aims to do is to introduce a new way of establishing financial products um, that's both decentralized, not controlled in any way, is trustless and transparent. So if we look at the DEFI uh, set of protocols and applications, um, you can see that there's a whole range of different services that are being offered in the space. Uh, there's distributed exchanges, which remove um, some of the concerns that many uh, people have around uh, working with uh, traditional centralized exchanges. Um, there's a, very, a variety of different loan products that are out there where um, you can take your cryptocurrency, uh, pass it onto a platform and earn some interest uh, in, in, in it instead of leaving that, um, that money to, um, let's say, decay over time. Uh, there's also the concept of stable coins, where um, you can basically take your cryptocurrency, convert it into a stable coin, which uh, is pegged against the US dollar or some other fiat currency. Um, and that's another way of ensuring that your hard-earned cryptocurrency coins um, do not necessarily fluctuate in value um, as the market uh, continues to, get, to be volatile. And of course, all the other things like the asset swaps and derivatives that are also there. So how is this big as this market? Well, um, I found this quite fascinating, but earlier on in the year, uh, the uh, total value that was locked up in the DEFI um, various protocols uh, and, and projects um, was around $1 billion. Um, and over the last couple of months, it's actually shot up to um, just over $4 billion uh, in, in, in value locked in. Um, so what we can see here is there's this tremendous amount of growth um, that's taking place. Um, and this may continue in the future as long as there aren't any big uh, hacks that, that come up and, and the confidence in, in these products um, doesn't start to fail. In terms of distribution, uh, you can see that from the lending side, that, that's, that's one of the uh, more popular uh, platforms and products. Um, I'm assuming that's because it's actually quite easy to understand. Uh, we're talking about effectively about loaning uh, or either borrowing money or loaning money into um, the system uh, and then getting some profit out of that through uh, some additional interest um, or being able to leverage the loans in order to invest in, in other products in the system. Uh, distributed exchanges, again, gaining some value. Um, derivatives and payments, um, still early days, but uh, you know, again, the facilities are there and there's some very interesting ways in which these um, protocols can be configured, um, which cannot actually be set up in the real world. So I suspect um, the investment bankers out there will be looking at uh, DEFI as it continues to mature um, and seeing how they can exploit um, some of the, the value that it can provide. So how can you earn passive income crypto style? Well, um, if you have a look on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, you can see a number of different projects um, and DEFI projects that are out there providing the various services that I mentioned, lending, derivatives, distributed exchanges, assets or stable coins. Um, and you've got a whole pick uh, there of different types of uh, companies um, and platforms that, that you can go to. On the right-hand side, you can also see that as part of these platforms, um, there are also a variety of different interest rates associated with the different types of coins um, and tokens that you might want to invest in. So if you look at Nexo, for example, uh, you can get an 8% return um, if uh, you invest in, um, in one of their products and perhaps uh, buy some DAI and um, 
and 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 look to uh, get some value from that. Um, you know, if you go down the list, Nuo 13.68%. Um, so w w when you're looking at these numbers, um, of course, you're not going to earn this type of return uh, from a bank today. Um, but but of course, there's obviously a lot more risk involved in this, and that's why uh, these prices tend to fluctuate a lot. So before we go any further, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about some terminology. Uh, firstly, crypto wallets. So many of you will be familiar with crypto wallets. Um, you know, th this is the place where uh, you have your private keys and um, you hold your cryptocurrency. And it's, of course, an area that you need to protect really well. Um, in the context of distributed finance, um, the, the wallet is also used and can be the key um, towards holding source code. Uh, or smart contracts. And that becomes quite important as we look at the security of these uh, platforms. So when we look at uh, platforms such as Ethereum, for example, it not only has a cryptocurrency, which is the Ether, but um, it has a whole distributed system available, which is based on executing distributed code um, in the form of smart contracts. And once again, the control of those contracts, when they're uploaded, what the contents of them are, um, etc. It is all linked into the uh, crypto wallets that, that's associated with those projects. In order to unlock those, uh, we talk about admin keys. And uh, these are kind of like the, the, the keys to the kingdom, uh, the, almost similar to the domain administrator accounts in the Windows world, um, for those of you that are joining from the security community today. And effectively, if you get hold of these keys, um, you can do a whole lot of bad stuff um, including potentially uploading or changing smart contracts. Now, why would that be important? Well, um, inside the wallet, we've got a whole lot of cash. And smart contracts define uh, a, a way in which uh, transactions can communicate and um, can take place over the blockchain. So if we have a wallet that has a lot of cash in it, and we have an ability to influence the logic by which that cash gets used uh, then it obviously can be very detrimental um, to, uh, to the, de the, the, the DeFi platform. Um, there's also a concept of time lock, and um, this, uh, this isn't uh, got anything to do with uh, going back in time. But what, what it is, is it's, it's, it's a method um, that owners of the uh, DeFi platform can use to effectively slow down um, the transactions that are taking place on the blockchain. And um, this is very useful because uh, it, it allows um, the owners or those that are governing uh, the DeFi projects um, to potentially um, have a look at any unusual transactions. Um, and normally there's a time window, either it's four hours, 72 hours, 48 hours, um, that the owners of that platform uh, or the, those that govern the platform can actually monitor the transactions and potentially reverse any transactions that have been introduced into the system um, by uh, an unauthorized uh, hacker or potentially even just by mistake. So that's something that's really key to, uh, to look into. Um, there's a big debate around you know, decentralization uh, and, also, and centralization, right? So we spoke at the beginning, the whole purpose of, de 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 of distributed finance is to have decentralized uh, systems and finance that is not under anyone's control. Um, and by putting in the time lock, we're effectively giving a level of that control back to the owners and those that run the project in order to better control it um, in, in the case of things going horribly wrong. Uh, but, but I think you know, for, for most of us that are still, uh, let's say, dabbling in this particular world, um, it, it's better to have some level of governance in place um, to protect uh, the assets and the information and, of course, the currencies that are in there. Uh, we also have the concept of an oracle, and um, this can either be a, a system that's inside the decentralized um, ecosystem uh, of the, the, the DeFi platform, um, or it's something that the DeFi platform uses as a source of information in order to make decisions. So um, an oracle could, for example, be publishing prices for various types of coins, like I showed you earlier. Um, that are coming from various exchanges and pumping that information back into the, um, the DeFi protocol and application 
so that it can use them in order to make decisions. Um, now, again, there's pros and cons on, on whether this Oracle concept is a good idea or not. Um, if we look into peg, um, for example, a, a currency against the dollar, then we do need an Oracle that can tell us what the price of the dollar is um, and, and you know, provide an accurate reflection of what's happening in the real world. Um, so there are some benefits to it. But of course, um, you know, if we're able to influence or compromise the, the Oracle, um, that can have devastating effects um, on the DEFI project. And finally, uh, we talk about dApps or smart contracts. And you know, once again, this is the, the source code that's been run on the blockchain. Um, it's source code that is immutable. Um, it, it runs and could you know, run forever on the blockchain. It's been signed. Um, it's, it's available to be reviewed and, 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 um, and seen by, uh, by those that transact with it. Um, and it forms the heart of the logic behind uh, the, the DeFi platform. Okay, so how does this work in practice? Um, so I'll just give you a quick example. Um, let's, let's take a cryptocurrency investor and um, she decides she's got some Bitcoin. She's really worried about the fluctuation of the Bitcoin, which I believe is about uh, $11,000 today. Uh, if we went back a couple of months, it was a lot less than that. Um, but if we went back maybe two or three years, we, we had obviously um, a real spike in, in the prices. So, you know, with her hard-earned hard Bitcoin, she's got a choice either to keep that um, in Bitcoin or to potentially um, loan it out to a DeFi platform uh, and um, gain some interest or gain some potential value from that. So she deposits uh, some Bitcoin into the DeFi platform. Uh, there'll be a smart contract within the DeFi platform that will effectively receive that, uh, that Bitcoin. It, it might wrap it up or transfer it into a token. And in my case, I'm going to use um, the DAI token as an example. Um, and and that, that basically allows um, our investor to take these stock tokens and potentially push them into other DeFi products in order to earn interest um, or uh, potentially just to peg the value of that Bitcoin against the dollar one-to-one. Um, -one. Because as I mentioned, uh, DAI coin is a stable coin, um, which, which is um, you know, uh, uh, linked to, um, to, uh, to the dollar. So she can then take that, um, that DAI coin and actually push it into um, potentially another platform, uh, which might actually go ahead and invest um, that DAI coin into other products, um, which then could actually generate some level of return uh, for her. At some point, um, she might then decide, uh, you know, there's been some growth or perhaps there's been some stability um, in the DAI coin, but it's time to cash out and she wants her Bitcoins back. So um, she can go back to the platform and effectively, um, the platform might again do some checks against the Oracle uh, to see the current price uh, between the, the DAI and, and, and the Bitcoin um, and, and then push that Bitcoin back um, to her. Now, of course, this, this is what would happen in theory, but you know, sometimes that money might disappear. Um, why might it disappear? Well, you know, potentially the, the DeFi platform, uh, which is, is holding these Bitcoins, May not, have, may not still have the Bitcoins that were provided by her and by other cryptocurrency um, in investors. Uh, it is also possible, and, and we talk about liquidity, um, that uh, there simply isn't enough cryptocurrency um, inside the, de the DeFi to be able to pay out all the uh, people that have, um, have loaned its uh, uh, money, uh, and that, that could also uh, potentially uh, be, be a problem. Um, or, of course, you know, maybe somebody might um, in intercept or influence the logic within the DeFi platform uh, and uh, basically change the smart contract um, to maybe push the money somewhere else um, rather than to the person that had requested it. So let's talk a little bit about um, the attacks on the blockchain and, um, you know, yes, yeah, smashing stacks, breaking blocks or loosening the chains for profit. Um, so once again, you know, the, the high-level scenario of uh, our investor um, or a person that has some cryptocurrency um, looking to uh, engage with the, the, the DApp ecosystem uh, in order to um, get some value from their currency. Um, you've got the Oracle and the exchanges on the right-hand side that this particular uh, DeFi application or platform 
um, is relying on. Uh, and of course, you know, we might have a corporate entity that is owning and running and governing the, uh, the DEFI platform. So let's, let's look at um, some of the potential attacks that could occur um, throughout this life cycle. Firstly, from the user's perspective, um, users can you know, be phished, their passwords and keys um, could potentially be stolen. Um, as we've seen in the case of the Twitter attack that happened just uh, over a month ago, um, you know, social engineering scams are possible too. So hackers might not necessarily get in and steal um, the, the, the keys, but you know, if they can convince the person to transfer some money across, then um, you know, they can lose that way. Uh, and, and of course, there are potential uh, vulnerabilities in the software that, um, that the user is, um, has downloaded or is using, which might intercept communications um, and potentially steal the keys. If we move into the, uh, the, the distributed environments, um, and again, a good, you know, good example of this is Ethereum, uh, which leverages uh, the ERC-20 uh, tokens. Um, there are still vulnerabilities in smart contracts, and we'll talk a little bit about more of those. Um, there is the possibility of key compromises. Um, there are DDoS attacks, potential man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, often that occur because uh, there, there's often an interface between these dApps, a web interface or an API, um, and, and again, its users. Um, and so again, depending on where the keys are um, and uh, the way things get handled, there, there, there is some possibility to, um, uh, you know, to, to perform some attacks there. Um, from a protocol perspective, again, all of these uh, distributed apps, Ethereum itself, you know, it's still relatively new um, and there may still be some underlying vulnerabilities um, in the way that the distributed system is working. Um, and I guess we still have to, see, time will tell whether some of those get out there in the wild or not. Um, the oracles themselves, so you know, again, the whole purpose for having the blockchain and these cryptocurrencies is that they are you know, inherently secure um, and built with all the wonderful cryptography and so on that's inside them. Um, but when they start relying on, on third parties, uh, for example, the oracles and the exchanges, um, that, that's potentially when things can go wrong. Uh, so once again, the oracle might be um, manipulated to provide the wrong interest rates, for example, or an exchange might make a mistake and publish the wrong rates, um, which could then lead to people taking advantage of that. Um, one thing that we've, we've looked at in, in our research is um, the corporate entity itself. And um, this is really important because um, these apps are run by people and um, by a company, often a startup, um, maybe it's a small organization to start to begin with that grows um, but there are people in the side of that organization um, that communicate um, with customers and with individuals um, and those that have invested in uh, the tokens and the cryptocurrencies. Um, some of those people also uh, might operate and have access to um, the keys um, and the wallets. Um, some of them might have to update the smart contracts from time to time. Um, and, and so the corporate entity itself needs to have a level of security that we would expect of a bank or another financial institution. Um, but of course, because a lot of these uh, organizations are still growing, um, they may not necessarily have matured yet to provide all the right um, OPSEC that we would expect. So um, another route into this environment could potentially be um, through the entity or the organization that, that is uh, running the platform, um, targeting either the employees or some of their resources, their email, their social media, um, et cetera. So um, if we look just in the last couple of months, uh, there have been quite a few um, hacks that have taken place um, in the DeFi world. Um, most notably the, the BZX um, hack, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but you know, literally um, within a couple of days, they lost around a million dollars in, in a very sophisticated attack, which um, impresses a lot of folks that, that have looked into this. Um, Maker itself, uh, it, it had a price crash. It wasn't specifically a deliberate attack. But um, you know, there was a drop in ether um, that happened for a few seconds, uh, and this uh, landed up causing um, a lot of mayhem. Uh, and Maker actually had some liquidity challenges, um, which actually forced a lot of the uh, users on the platform to have their loans effectively cancelled. Um, and uh, in order for Maker to, to you know, ensure that it had the right level of liquidity. 
uh, and, th and there's a big class action um, suit going on right now for those uh, individuals that um, have lost money by loaning money into Maker and not being able to get it out again. Um, again, uh, later in the year, we, we had IMBTC being hacked uh, by an ERC-777 re-entry attack. Now, um, for those of you that know about the, the DAO attack that happened a few years ago on the Ethereum platform, um, this is a very similar type of attack. Um, and interestingly, uh, a day later, there was another platform, uh, LendFMe, that lost 25 million uh, because they were using the same source code in their smart contract as um, as a, a, another organization. Um, so again, you know, th these things kind of can happen um, in, in various different ways. Talking a little bit about the BZ uh, X hacks, and I, I don't want to spend too much time in this area, but you know, when, when we think about hacks and exploits, um, you know, the ninjas of the security community are um, running uh, machine code and machine level assembly. Um, you know, to to smash the stacks and and uh, b do buffer overloads and all sorts of things. Um, and what we see here is a different type of hack. Uh, we see that uh, somebody with a lot of knowledge uh, was able to leverage the different protocols, um, leverage the different uh, the different DeFi protocols out there, uh, DYDX, which was allowing loaning, um, Compounds, which was uh, allowing interest, um, that the Kyber network and the Uniswap network, which were um, allowing uh, people to swap coins. Um, and they exploited um, basically a, a situation where an exchange was providing a, a very favorable um, rate of uh, interest, or we call it interest or pricing for a particular coin combination. Um, and they realized this. Um, they took advantage of something called a flash loan, uh, which is a very interesting concept in the DeFi world that allows people to borrow money without providing any collateral um, as long as they borrow the money carry out a transaction and pay the money back very quickly um, the platform is happy to support that and that's exactly what happened in this particular instance so they borrowed some money from the dydx uh, loan platform 10,000 ETH. Um, they uh, then did some fancy um, transactions and manipulations um, they took advantage of the, the price uh, hedge if you like, that, um, that they found in the markets. Um, and then they were able to then uh, pay back that loan and profit a around $300,000 uh, for that particular transaction. Literally a few days later, they did the same thing um, and managed to earn another 600000 So in response to this, um, the uh, BZX actually made some, uh, some really dramatic statements, uh, which I'd like to read out. Um, you know, this attack was one of the most sophisticated we've ever seen, possibly only with an extremely in-depth knowledge of every DeFi protocol and its tools. This space is evolving quickly. The security is becoming increasingly more dire as the barriers to entry for executing, executing an exploit drop to zero. There is no analog for this in the traditional finance system, and we're now in unch uncharted territories. So if that doesn't give you um, a huge amount of confidence, then um, you, know, you, you might want to think twice about using these, uh, these particular platforms. But, um, but with anything, you know, this happened on the internet and e-commerce many moons ago. Um, eventually, you know, the maturity uh, uh, of, of the industries um, get there uh, and um, it becomes harder to do these types of things. So um, again, if you're looking to put some money into one of these platforms, um, how might you assess whether they're, they're good, they're safe, they're bad, uh, et cetera? So that, that's where our research comes in. And um, the first thing we did, which, uh, again, I find quite interesting, uh, you know, you think you've got a good idea and uh, you do some Googling and then you find out actually quite a lot of other people have come up with the same idea. So um, uh, it's part of the early research. Um, we found that there, there is an open source uh, group um, or groups. There's a DeFi score as well as DeFi Watch um, and the, uh, the Codify uh, project as well, um, that, that essentially are starting to build out an index of um, various features on the DeFi platform that give us some indication of how risky they may be. Um, so some of the types of things that uh, the DeFi score provides, for example, um, is looking at, you know, has this particular platform carried out any um, 
any smart contract audits, how many audits, um, do they use a time lock or do they not? Um, have they implemented some form of multi-signature uh, for protecting those very special admin keys that, that I spoke about earlier? Um, they also then look into some additional factors which are more linked to um, the financial viability of the platform. And that includes the liquidity index, um, the centralization index, and the utilization index. Uh, but all of these things come together to form a score out of 10, um, which is there to try and help and guide those that want to potentially put money in. You might get all excited about that 13% rate you're going to get, but then you, know, you might want to check to see whether that particular platform has scored very well um, on a DEFI score or on some other score. So with, with that in mind, um, we, we thought we would build upon this platform. And um, one thing that we did notice is that, again, the, the, the communities that developed this actually are, form part of the community and part of the crypto community. So the focus of their scoring was very much based on um, some of the things in the crypto world. Uh, and, and so we, we coming from, a, a let's say, a wider cybersecurity perspective, started to think about some of the other um, uh, OSINs that we might be able to um, find about those companies. So we took it a traditional approach. We looked at um, uh, IP addresses, DNS records. Um, we looked at the email platform that these particular providers were uh, are using. Uh, we looked at a couple of um, uh, open sources uh, connected to the internet, um, mail servers, web servers, etc. Um, we looked on LinkedIn uh, to see what kind of social media platform they have. Uh, we did some threat intel um, to see whether there's any chatter involved um, in, in these particular projects. Um, we also assessed the, the bug bounty and, and um, how ready um, or how mature they are in, in using um, the hacking community uh, to find vulnerabilities and, and publish those. Um, and, and also, you know, whether they were open sourced or closed sourced um, and, and whether there was any breach history. Uh, finally, we also looked at uh, privacy and cookies. Um, just to kind of get a perspective on whether, from a regulatory perspective, these guys are starting to think about some of those really important things that um, regulators look out for when you're dealing with uh, with individuals and consumers, especially those, for example, in, in Europe under GDPR. Um, on the crypto OSIN side, um, again, we, we kind of thought through the, the various um, indexes that uh, DEFI, the DEFI score had already provided. Um, and then we thought about a few other things like, um, you know, general audits, uh, publication of um, whether they've been assessed by third parties. Um, you know, we, we wanted to look into cryptocurrency transactions and how well, um, whether, whether there was any links between fraudulent transactions and, and, the, um, and, and the platforms, um, the financial backing, uh, and also whether there's any mention of KYC, know your client uh, procedures. Once again, going back to the beginning of my talk, um, you know, if any of these platforms start to receive uh, cryptocurrency funds as a result of a fraud or an attack, um, then uh, they shouldn't be accepting them. Or potentially, if they have accepted them, maybe there's something we can do to seize those assets before they go back um, to, to those that have stolen them. So um, I guess just a caveat in terms of the limitations of our research, uh, we, we sampled 17 projects, uh, both a mix of large, medium, and small uh, DEFI projects. And we did this over a period of seven days. Um, because of the type of testing that we performed, which was very non-intrusive, obviously we don't have any permission to do any testing. Um, so we, we could only look at open source information. Um, and as a result of that, some of the findings might be false positives, um, and of course, there's certain things that are very hard for us to gather um, from, from, the, uh, from the open source. Uh, but, but also, there, there are quite a few important things that we definitely were not able to look at, and things like incident response planning, you know, being able to deal very quickly with um, a breach scenario where perhaps the keys have been stolen or there, there is a smart contract uh, vulnerability. Um, key generation storage, people talk about the fact that they're using multi-sigs, but are they really? Um, you know, have that, has that been audited? Um, ha have they done all the right things? Um, the Oracle, the Oracles and Exchanges, uh, we didn't look too much into into that world. Um, and of course, some of these smart contracts themselves might be linked to other smart contracts. Um, and I mentioned the protocol fuzzing and security is something that we didn't get into either. 
Um, in terms of the scope and uh, the way that we carried out the testing and the scoring, um, we, we, we did a subjective scoring, um, fairly simple crude approach where we allocated a score of one if the, the practices were very poor, a two for medium or a three for high. Um, we also uh, took the view that we wouldn't necessarily skew any of the findings um, and weights against uh, in a particular categories. Um, it's recognized that certain types of tests are going to have more of an impact than others, um, but also that might depend on the type of attack that we worried about. So you know, if we're worried about phishing attacks, then certain types of dimensions will actually carry more weight than others. Um, if we're more worried about, uh, for example, the, the smart contracts having poor code, then you know, we would have um, a higher weight on some of the, the categories um, that, that link into smart contracts. So um, without further ado, I'll talk about some of the results. Um, and um, as you can see on the left-hand side, we've basically uh, segmented the vendors into large, medium, and small. Um, the reds, again, are, are those um, organizations that have been marked as having very low um, security, in our opinion. Um, those in the, in the middle with the yellow and um, th those that um, are doing pretty well uh, in, in, in the green. Um, and as you, as you can see, you know, when, if we start with a multi-sig, um, we have quite a lot of small and um, mid-sized companies that haven't gone with this multi-sig approach. Uh, and and that's, um, that's, I guess it's a bit disappointing in a way because you know, a lot of these projects are small, but they can grow um, very quick, very big, very quickly. Uh, and if they haven't done the basics of um, setting up their wallets and their uh, key administration in the right way in the early days, then it can be quite difficult to retrofit that um, as the project um, kind of goes from zero to zero. Um, also, interestingly, you know, there were, there, in the large category, there was one that, that, that wasn't using uh, multi-sig, which again was, was quite a surprise. Um, and these kind of multi-sigs also range from um, kind of two of two all the way to um, you know, three of five or uh, three of eight. Um, so th there were you know, quite a few that are starting to adopt um, what I call very good practices around having uh, potentially, you know, quite a few mul uh, signatures, uh, multi-signatories on, on um, uh, having access to the keys, um, often distributed um, across different organizations as well to, to really make it, uh, make it effective. Um, but, what, but one of the issues here, again, is that it's very hard to tell exactly how this was implemented. Um, you can have multi-signatures, but, you know, you could have three signatures Maybe they're paper-based, but they're all in the same place. Um, and, and therefore, the, the kind of OPSEC on the key management is something that um, is very hard to distill. Um, there also weren't many talking about, if not any, talking about audits that, that, that these companies had done um, on their key generation process, which I think is fundamental and something that um, happens a lot in the traditional finance industry today. Um, time locks. Uh, so once again, you know, I mentioned this earlier. I think it's a pretty good idea to do this. Um, it gives some confidence um, to those that are using the platform that if something goes wrong by mistake, or potentially again uh, because somebody's done something bad, um, there is a way to roll back. Um, there's a way to monitor and um, get ahead of of the the, the the transactions and and do something about it. Um, and once again, you can see a mixture of large, medium, and small companies that ha actually haven't implemented this. Um, as we move on to uh, the, 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 uh, the, other the other thing of interest on the time lock side was, again, you know, some projects are, are using 48 hours, um, some are using four hours, others 72. Um, you know, again, I, I, I kind of, as a more conservative individual, would rather go with a slightly longer period. Um, it might mean that certain transactions take a little bit longer to take place, but at least I know that if I've put my Bitcoin into that platform um, and something goes wrong, um, you know, I've got a chance of, of, of keeping it um, ra rather than uh, the, the purest approach of decentralized decentralization um, where effectively the transactions happen and um, there's nothing you can do about it. From an Oracle perspective, again, um, some interesting results on, on those that are using Oracle's um, external oracles, those are some of that are using their own. Um, and uh, we found some interesting concentration risk in this space where um, quite a few organizations are using the same external oracle. 
Um, so that that might you know potentially ring some alarm bells um, if if those particular oracles are not set up in in the right way. Um, something that was really disappointing was um, no real discussions uh, around KYC. Um, and again, you know I think this is really important um, in the longer term if you want to have a legitimate uh, business that's going to deal with um, the, the kind of wider market, the wider finance market. Um, and um, this is something that, for whatever reason, these players are, are not necessarily um, too fo focused on today. I suspect that as um, the industry matures uh, and uh, some of the platforms do want to um, you know, become more regulated, um, th this will have to change. On the smart contract side, again, kind of a mix. Um, in, for this particular dimension, we, we looked at whether the smart contracts were uh, being reused by others uh, and uh, other organizations, um, and we found quite a few of those. A couple of smart contracts that had been compiled with older versions of compilers, uh, some of which are known to have uh, security weaknesses in them. Uh, and, and then, um, uh, you know, qu quite a few that um, that actually w were not uh, very forthcoming with with publishing um, inf certain information about their smart contracts. Um, we did see some very positive signs on the side of smart contract audits, um, and uh, here quite a few of the platforms are doing regular audits. Um, it kind of ranged from two to fifteen, uh, and that kind of got me thinking. Well, you know, maybe you need to audit these things a bit more frequently. Um, but what was quite strange was that um, probably you know, aligned to the whole open source methodology, um, the audit results were open sourced as well as all of the audit reports. Um, and this contains a wealth of information uh, about um, what the testers did, um, you know, pieces and snippets of source code, um, and you know, various types of vulnerabilities that they found, um, which you know, personally I think might be a little bit unnecessary. Um, you know, I think it's good that an audit has happened it's good to understand um, that remediation was, was taking place, but you know, really to, to show the full-blown audits every time uh, might be giving a little bit away, especially if those testers um, didn't find all the holes and you know, perhaps there, there are a few extra things um, that are out there. Um, great news for the community at DEF CON um, that are involved in uh, bug bounty programs and supporting them, um, you know, so, some good uh, indications that, that the DEFI industry is taking this um, on board as well. And uh, if, if you're interested, go and have a look. You know, programs vary from $10,000 all the way up to $250,000. Um, so put down those laptops and, and get started. Um, interestingly enough, a few projects are actually not offering to pay you in uh, real money, but um, you know, to pay you in their own tokens, um, which again, you know, potentially could be very valuable or um, potentially not, depending on the circumstances. Um, if, if we have a look at the general OSINT, uh, so you know, one of the first things we did was we looked at whether you know, these particular organizations had been hacked in the past. Um, I decided to redact the findings in that section because it might kind of indicate um, some of the organizations uh, involved in our study. Um, so uh, you know, what I can say is that um, there was a mix uh, you know, of, of large, medium, and small um, organizations that have been hit um, in the past. Um, and, you know, again, is that an indicator that the company is bad? Um, or is it an indicator that because they've been hit, they've actually now put in a lot better controls, they've learned their lesson, and they're improving their security? Um, and often, in my experience, those that have a breach do come out of it um, a lot better in the longer term if they're still around. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of one factor. Um, we, we did look into uh, credentials that are on the web uh, and on the dark net that have been sold um, for you know, particular platforms. Um, and that was on average pretty good. Uh, as you can see, there was a surprisingly large organization that had quite a lot of data uh, published. And um, this is something that uh, we, we will need to take up with, with, this, with the vendor directly um, because I think it's something that, that they should be looking into. Um, uh, and um, yeah, but otherwise pretty good. Uh, and, and you know, once again, this is the kind of thing, it's a bit hit and miss, um, but it was interesting that we did get two results coming uh, through that particular dimension. Um, Anti-spam protection. So uh, you know, obviously we, we discussed how important phishing is, 
um, to either the users um, that could be targeted uh, and, um, and also the individuals that are working for the platform. Um, and um, here we, we did find that the maturity within the space um, you know, was actually okay uh, for, platform, uh, for protocols like SPF, um, but for DMARC, it, it was actually around 50%. Um, and for DCOM, it was uh, very low as well. So I think there's, there is definitely some room for improvements um, for these companies to uh, be setting up their DNS records and their mail records um, so that they can better protect themselves and their customers from um, you know, phishing-related um, attacks. Um, I mentioned infrastructure, and you know we, we took a, a very hands-off approach to this. So we we looked in in, in Shodan um, and pointed some of the project IP addresses um, to the Shodan platform, um, and we came up with a couple of uh, interesting results: um, some unnecessary ports, uh, some some remote access um, facilities that perhaps shouldn't be there. Uh, but again, kind of a mix and something that, that, that you probably would find if you um, did, did a proper scan on, on, on a lot of organizations. Uh, but, but definitely something that uh, needs improvements um, for, the, you know, for the reasons that, I, that I've, I've spoken about before. Um, we, we dipped into the darknet uh, chatter and we had a look to see who, you know, who was talking about particular projects. Um, and, and again, we found some information, you know, no, nothing earth shattering. Uh, but definitely some talk um, about targeting or um, you know weaknesses, vulnerabilities, etc. Um, and and again, this is something that probably the uh, the project owners should should be definitely be dialing into just to make sure there's nothing um, major that that's been discussed and, and you know giving them a head start to try and fix um, any issues that arise. From a social media perspective, we just chose LinkedIn. Uh, we had a look at individuals um, that belong to these projects. Um, interestingly, I was looking for some CISOs or kind of security managers, and I didn't find many. Um, so either those involved are pretty good with their own OSINT, um, or perhaps, and I think this is more likely, there, there, there aren't too many people in these organizations that have the title of CISO or security manager. We saw a lot of CTOs, we saw a lot of coups, um, but you know, not, not that many uh, people with a security title, um, and that again, you know, is, is just something to be wary of. You know, if if uh, if you don't have anyone focused and dedicated in the space, um, then, then then you might fall short. Um, you know, and and that's you know kind of why you need to take these these things a little bit more seriously. Um, quite a few uh, people in the IT department uh, publishing information about themselves. Um, and again, you know, that could be potentially used as, as a target. Um, kind of very old OSINT around who is, uh, you know, most people did this very well. Um, we did come across one company that was allegedly in stealth uh, mode, but, you know, had, had leaked um, some of their details in, in the who is uh, information. Um, but, but, you know, pretty good on that side. Um, and then, you know, data privacy policies, as well as cookies, um, we did a quick check on uh, whether these particular aspects were being taken care of on, on the websites. Um, we found that most were not compliant to GDPR, um, and actually some of the, pol the privacy policies felt short of um, some of the requirements that, that, that are expected. Um, so once again, you know, these organizations dealing with consumers um, might, might need to dial into this vector um, as well because it could, could come back to bite them. Um, on a hosting um, side and as well as on an email platform side, uh, we saw some concentration risk on you know, particular vendors being chosen to, um, to host websites, um, to support DDoS platforms, um, and also to support the, uh, the email platform as well. Um, so I guess some, some of the highlights again, uh, smart contracts, 64% uh, um, were being audited, uh, but the full results were published. Um, 64% of the smart contracts required some kind of improvements, either through because of reuse or older compilers being used. Um, you know, some vendor concentration in the uh, in the use of, of uh, external oracles. Um, time locks, again, 58% not using them. That, that's a bit disappointing. Uh, almost 50% not using multi-signatures, um, and you know, uh, missing audits in the in the key management space, um, as well as poor KYC and privacy activities. 
Right, on the OSINT side, um, great registration on the IP, mixed DNS results, as I mentioned, um, some chatter going on, credentials being dumped, poor cookies and, and, and policies, uh, privacy policy management, um, and so on. So with, with the scoring, um, we, we basically put together our score and you know, allocated out the, uh, the various um, companies against, against the score. And you kind of see kind of a mix. It's, it's not a huge uh, differential. Um, some of that differentiation was coming in two very particular dimensions that we assessed. Um, interestingly, looking at the DEFI score itself, we actually found that of the companies we looked at, 50% of them had the same kind of ranking um, as, as our scoring, um, but actually 33% were worse and 70% uh, were, were slightly better. Um, and, and therefore, you know, our conclusion in this is, is definitely that, you know, we need a combination of uh, both, you know, crypto and, and open OSINT in order to tackle this thing correctly. Um, you know, by breaking it up into large, medium and small, uh, some of the results that, that can be seen there do indicate, as expected, the larger projects, um, you know, probably are ahead in certain areas. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, definitely there, there is um, some room for, uh, for improvement. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, when, when we look at the OSINT, um, we, we can see there that there are a couple of large projects that actually fall uh, behind the mark compared to um, some of the, the medium and, and small uh, businesses. Um, but, but often the, the, the small and medium ones are the ones that actually do need to, um, to, you know, to, 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 to improve. Okay, so um, wrapping up, our, our conclusion is that you know, DEFI definitely needs to do more to maintain trust and stay out of the headlines. Um, whilst we're encouraged that the, uh, there are some community-driven activities to provide transparency and raise the bar, um, not everybody is covered in these uh, community-driven activities. And um, there are a few extra dimensions around security and OSINT that we think need to be added. Um, a lot of goodness out there, but you know, not really full consistency. Uh, and as I described, quite a few of the larger players um, that are mature, but you know, there, there's some that actually are not fully there and, and are missing the mark. Uh, we did find some isolated, um, highly vulnerable indicators um, of potential issues. Um, we, we do see some high potential for phishing attacks uh, given the concentration of uh, usage of certain email platforms um, that, that, that the industry is, is relying on. Um, and also some smart contracts improvements uh, on, on the management of those contracts that, that need to be done, especially around reuse and, um, and looking into the, um, the compilers that are compiling the code. Um, once again, I think I mentioned this a few times, but uh, just wanted to repeat it again, lack of transparency on the key OPSEC. So, um, you know, again, if those keys get stolen, um, it's, it, there's a, it, there is a chance of the uh, smart contracts being rewritten and changed. Um, but, you know, we don't know how well that's been done. Um, and uh, I think the industry and stakeholders would be keenly interested to see, um, to see how that happens in, in practice. Uh, and as we move towards a, a more regulated environment, um, data privacy and KYC are, are also extremely important. So um, some final recommendations, lock down your G Suites and Office 365 environments, train your staff uh, to minimize public information leaks and phishing attacks, dip into the world of threat intelligence and look into stolen credentials and chatter just to make sure that you're not, not on the list. Check out and make sure that your dependency on uh, vendors is appropriate and that there's no, not too much um, concentration risk associated with certain um, suppliers, vendors, oracles, etc. Make sure that you're using the right level of um, security on your email domains. On the crypto side, um, again, tuning into the threat intelligence is important. Regular code reviews, but don't necessarily publish everything. Um, provide greater assurance over the OPSEC. Uh, ensure that those oracles are protected and can be really trusted. For those of you that are not um, implementing bug bounty programs, have a look at them. I think there's a lot of value in them. Uh, and um, you know, make sure the keys are adequately protected. 
whilst I know there's a strong move towards decentralization, I do think an element of governance for centralization is the way to go. Um, and um, I see, see that as, as the, the, the kind of future stable way in which um, DEFI projects will succeed. Um, from a research perspective, I think that there's still quite a lot to do here. Um, you know, it would be great to have an automated scoring process uh, very similar to what DEFI score has um, for the uh, crypto uh, controls. Um, I think we could expand out into the general OSINT, as I mentioned before. Um, it would be great to have some better tools and visibility on smart card contract code um, that's automated, that can be published and, and is available to the community. Um, I think further adoption of transaction analysis for KYC and fraud is going to be really important to make um, DEFI uh, kind of hit the prime time in the future. Uh, and, and of course, you know, doing uh, protocol stress testing um, and, and further, um, uh, you know, digging into the uh, key management um, OPSEC is, is also really important. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, give a very special thanks to some folks that uh, helped me through uh, this presentation, um, you know, specifically Danny Howard, who um, was responsible for the illustrious slides um, that, that have been put together. Uh, and um, Nick and Ferez helped out with some of the research. Um, this particular piece of work also couldn't have been done without uh, leveraging a lot of valuable resources uh, from the DEFI Score project, the DEFI Watch project, Codify project, and also DEFI Prime. Um, so I encourage you to read out, um, link out, reach out to these particular sites um, uh, if you want to learn more. Uh, and, and then I think I might have a little bit of time for questions. So um, I am listening in on the uh, presentation that's happening right now. Uh, so feel free to um, reach out with any questions that I can answer. And uh, appreciate it and hope to see you next year in Vegas uh, for another chat. Goodbye and stay safe.